is now my pleasure to introduce a really forward-looking thinker and a uh, leading edge um, man with a lot of courage of his convictions to state things that I think are true and uh, don't always come out in the press and the Darwinian uh, joke stuff. Uh, so, Dr. Uh, Yelanowicz, please help me out. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Bristol, for that uh, kind introduction and for your wonderful hospitality. For those of you who don't know me, I'm pretty much a recluse, one of those academic fellows who literally has his office in an attic and sits up there writing papers and books and so forth. So it was quite a shock when I came around the corner and suddenly saw my name up in lights. Uh, it was a shock because it was there. It was a shock because they could fit it on the marquee. Uh, I happen to have a daughter whose name is Anastasia. You know, Anastasia Yolanowicz, we couldn't get it across the, the, uh, the sweatshirt. Uh, and of course they had the problem here, so they've changed the title. Perspective is a big long name. They changed it to design. So if any of you have come tonight, uh, wanted to hear about design, I'm sorry. Uh, we won't directly talk about that uh, particular topic. But uh, I hope to say something interesting nonetheless. It's truly humbling to be here. I mean, after all, if you look back over the speakers who preceded me to this podium, uh, you've got world-class figures, knights, uh, uh, Nobel Prize winners, and so forth. Talk about a tough act to follow. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> so how do, how, do I, how do I face this? And I thought, well, the only way to do it is to show overweening hubris. So, if you'll indulge me tonight, I'm going to try to convince you that the core assumptions upon which we've based the scientific enterprise over the last 300 years are about 180 degrees in the wrong direction. And they lead us astray about the actual nature of things. Now, I know that sounds ridiculous. I mean, look at all the benefits that we get from science all over the place. And let me qualify that somewhat. I'm not going to be talking uh, about the scientific method, uh, nor am I going to be talking about the criteria by which we judge science. A lot of this has been written about both of those. Uh, rather, I'm going to talk about the fundamental assumptions, most of which are implicit, tacit, and not even verbalized, uh, that sort of create the lens, metaphorically, through which we look at the world. Now, this is a very important thing, it can be very dangerous, because as Oliver Penrose, we think it's a relative of the, my predecessor here at the podium, just wrote in Nature magazine, if you look at the world through rose-colored spectacles, you cannot tell which parts of it are really rosy and which parts just look rosy. Now, I'm hardly embarking on a pathway that hasn't been trodden before, and along the way I'm going to introduce to you a number of my heroes in this regard. Uh, but I'm going to start with the late Gregory Bateson, a Californian, who maintained that our current approach towards science in the world is radically wrong and ultimately self-destructive. And Bateson felt that the only way to avoid a bad end was to pursue what he called an ecology of mind. Now, by ecology, Bateson wasn't just hooking his star to the, to the burgeoning environmental movement. He didn't just look at uh, the, the, the problem of ecology as something to be solved. No, he looked upon it as a way that you actually have to view the world. Uh, as Arne Ness, uh, a, a Scandinavian ecologist, once talked about deep ecology, that it affects your life in a profound and ineffable way the way you view the world in a profound and ineffable way. And tonight, I, I hope to make the ecological vision just a little bit less ineffable than either Bateson or Ness would have you believe. So here's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to first of all try to talk about how do we currently view the world. And then I'm going to argue that laws and probabilities are inadequate to the open world of ecology. But I don't want to be all deconstructive. I want to offer you an alternative, alternative agencies to laws and forces that make things happen in ecology. 
Along the way, this scenario is going to suggest, hopefully to you, a new set of fundamental assumptions that lead more directly to the life process. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about the consequences of the new assumptions on our view of how we see the world. So let's begin with the scientific metaphysic, if you will. Metaphysic just being a set of fundamental assumptions. What is our scientific metaphysic? Well, as Thomas Kuhn remarked about our attitudes toward the criteria by which we judge science, they are many and they are varied and they vary from individual to individual. And this makes it very difficult to summarize. So what I've done is I've traced back in history uh, to the progenitor of most of the attitudes we have today to a time 200 years ago, the beginning of the 19th century, when there was near unanimity about how scientists were supposed to view the, uh, the natural world. So Weber and Depew, in their, their tome, Darwin is an Evolving, uh, enumerated those assumptions. First of all, Newtonian systems are causally closed. What does that mean? It says that we can only allow mechanical and material causes, and those causes must co-occur one with the other. Other forms of causality that, that people had talked about through the centuries, such as Aristotelian final causality or top-down causality, are strictly prescribed. Secondly, Newtonian systems are atomistic. Okay? They're strongly decomposable into stable least units, which can be taken apart and put back together again. Now, atomism, in connection with closure, leads to reductionism, the idea that all the truly interesting things take place at the very bottom, the very netherworld uh, that we occupy, and propagate upward. Um, thus it is, for example, I don't know how many of you remember Carl Sagan and his series Cosmos. Uh, and he had a segment on evolution, and Sagan liked dinosaurs. And he had these wonderful pictures of dinosaurs fighting and battling and eating one another and catching their prey and so forth. At the very end, his very last sentence in the program was, these are some of the things that molecules do. <laughs> Third, Newtonian systems are reversible. Laws governing behavior work the same in both directions. Take a picture of it, play it backwards, and you can't tell forward from back. Well, that sounds strange, you might say, but, but, but Emily Noether, around the beginning of, this, of the last century, showed where reversibility and conservation are two sides of the same coin, and almost all scientists have uh, some stake in conservation. Fourth, Newtonian systems are deterministic. If we know the precise conditions to begin with, if they're precise enough, we can predict the future to any arbitrary degree of accuracy. And then finally, physical laws are universal. They apply everywhere at all scales at all times. And now the key adverb here is everywhere, because in combination with determinism, the conclusion is that nothing occurs except that it be elicited by a fundamental physical law. Now, of course, today, you're probably saying to yourself, nobody believes all five of those. And you're right, because the, the enterprise of scientists o over the, the, of the last 200 years has gradually eroded some of those hypotheses. Uh, thus it is, for example, that uh, soon after Pierre Laplace exalted in the ascendancy of Newtonianism, Sadie Carnot, a French engineer, uh, Created, started the, the, the science of thermodynamics, which Dr. Bristol just talked to you about, whereby irreversibility was introduced into science. Later in the century, Charles Darwin would introduce history, in, which is all irreversibility and indeterminism, into the scientific narrative. Perhaps the final blows to, Newtonian, to the ascendancy of Newtonianism occurred at the change from the 19th to the 20th century. Uh, when relativity and quantum theories uh, surfaced to throw universality and determinism gravely into doubt. So, after two centuries of such erosion, the fabric of this classical assumptions lies in tatters, completely in tatters. And yet, 
almost every science clings tenaciously to some of its dangling threads. For example, that may not sound surprising to you, but, but what seems passing strange to me is that uh, those who are in uh, involved in the scientific venture where the mechanical seems least applicable are the most vociferous in maintaining it. Thus it is that closure is strictly enforced in the neo-Darwinian uh, scenario of evolution. Dawkins and Dennett, for example, are scrupulous in referring to only material and only uh, mechanical causes. Atomism or reductionism continues to dominate biology. Just pick up any, any, any issue of nature or science and, and most of the articles have to do with, with molecular biology or, or genetics. Uh, and daily, it seems, one hears echoes of Sagan about more of the many things that molecules do. As far as determinism goes, I think a surprising fraction of scientists today uh, believe that probability is just, just an appearance, and that if we really knew things more precisely, we could be able to explain things. Now, I would say that the devotion to such an outworn perspective perspective carries with it grave dangers, namely that we may be all clinging to an adumbrated and distorted view of reality. My favorite way of expressing this comes from the, the movie The Mosquito Coast. Uh, in it, the, uh, the son of the, the, the main character goes to the store and the storekeeper points to the, to the man, uh, to, the, to the son and says, your father is a dangerous man. He thinks he has all the answers, and he's right some of the time. And, you know, Dennett wrote Darwin's Dangerous Idea. Well, I feel it could be written, rewritten around this particular quote, as a matter of fact. Nevertheless, there is abroad this feeling that ecology doesn't quite fit into the same framework with the rest of the science. Why else would investigators in other fields attempt to cloak their endeavors in the mantle of ecology? Because if you look around, you'll see things like uh, Bernardo Huberman, who call, talks about the ecology of computational processes. There's an institute in Connecticut called the Ecological Study, uh, devoted to the ecological study of perception and action. Now, what I hope to convince you tonight is that there are aspects of ecology that violate all five of the Newtonian precepts. And I want to suggest to you the replacement by even a simpler set of assumptions. Now I'm going to begin not with an ecologist, but with a physicist, or really an erstwhile physicist, uh, the late Walter Elsasser. Elsasser devoted the latter part of his career looking at the logic of biology and comparing it with the logic of physics, which he knew very well as a physicist. And his argument focuses around the obvious heterogeneity or differences that characterize groupings in biology. Uh, biological entities all differ in at least minor ways from each other. So what kind of, of interactions can occur amongst groupings of different, uh, of different organisms or different, different species? Well, he points out that in physics, they deal with a continuum. Now, logically, uh, at the beginning of the last century, uh, Whitehead and Russell had a big long logical treatise called uh, Principia Mathematica, in which they showed that the treatment of reality as a continuum was predicated on something that they call uh, point-set theory. Now, to distill that, what they said is that physics always deals with homogeneous sets, groupings of things that are all absolutely the same and cannot be distinguished. Okay? And biology deals with heterogeneous groupings. Now, I can't go into the actual logic, I'm really not equipped to go into the actual log logical arguments of Whitehead and Russell, but I think I can give you a flavor for, uh, for what they are saying. 
Uh, I ask you to think of sets of homogeneous inter- integers, five tokens each, okay? A set of all, of, of five ones, a set of five twos, a set of five threes, et cetera, et cetera. Then I'm going to ask you to say, let's take a look at, a, at an operation between two of those sets. Let's say the set of five, five tokens two and five tokens four. And what we're going to do is we're going to multiply a member of set one by set two in some arbitrary way. And the result is going to be, well, in this case, it turns out that the result is always eight. The result is a determinate homogeneous set. Okay? Uh, it's just like hydrogen atoms or electrons. If you have um, a bunch of them in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a cylinder, you can't tell one from the other. And that's what allows you to, to actually apply laws to them. Now, what would be another way of looking at heterogeneous groupings? Okay, let's, let's consider now sets of, of different integers. Let's say the first set will be the integers 1 through 5. The second set will be the integers uh, 6 through 10. The third, third set 11 through 15 and so forth. And now let's do the same thing with the first set on itself. I do that just so the numbers don't get too large. Uh, and you see up here an arbitrary uh, a combination of the, of, of the first set upon itself in a random way. And what do we behold? Well, we behold that, that the products scatter themselves indeterminately, if you will, over three different sets. The, the, the two of the uh, products in, in, in the set one through five, uh, two of them in six through ten, and one in eleven through fifteen, and so forth. Elsasser's conclusions were that determinism among heterogeneous groupings uh, uh, is, is a logical contradiction. Anytime you have heterogeneous groupings and combine them in any way, uh, you're not going to get determinism. You're always going to get this, this scatter, if you will. Karl Popper followed upon that, saying that one must be prepared to generalize concepts to make them more applicable to, to, to general situations where you have indeterminacy and interference. Well, you might say, what's the news in that? I mean, that's what keeps statisticians busy in biology, after all. And uh, the truth of the matter is that there are statistical regularities among biological phenomena. But does that mean that the genie of chance is now back in the bottle? Can we, like our hero in the Mosquito Coast, say that uh, now we have access to all the answers, albeit in at least a statistical way? Well, Elsasser would say, no, definitely not. He would say that probability theory cannot be applied universally to chance phenomena in biology. Why? not. Okay, because probability theory makes three implicit assumptions that you don't hear much about. A, that that chance events are simple, B, that they're generic, and three, that they're repeatable. They recur many and many times. Elsasser, uh, in, in contradiction, says that the overwhelming majority of events in biology are unique. They occur once, and for all time, and for, for and never more. Huh. The second absurdity you've told us, is he going to say, okay? I mean, look at this universe, how huge it is, how long it's been, been around. You're going to mean to tell me that things don't happen again and again and again? Well, surprisingly enough, Elsass's assertion is rather easy to defend. He does so by defining what he calls an enormous number. An enormous number is a number of possibilities so large that it greatly exceeds the number of simple processes that could have possibly occurred in the whole universe since the Big Bang. Now, how does he do this? Well, he reckons that uh, physicists tell us that there are approximately 10 to the 85th elementary particles in the whole visible universe. uh, that, that's, that's, you know, one followed by 85 zeros, a really big number. Um, and, and then 
Then he says, okay, suppose these, these, these small particles were to act uh, at the characteristic time of subatomic uh, uh, reactions, let's say one nanosecond or one femtosecond, if you want to say one, one nanosecond, a billionth of a second. Well, they're approximately 10 to the 25th nanoseconds, 13.7 billion years, since the Big Bang. Okay. Multiplying these two, you get the outer limits of how many simple events, simple physical events could possibly have occurred since the Big Bang. And that comes out to be about 10 to, 100, to the 110th power. One with 110 zeros behind it. Really an enormous number, justifiably its name. Now, those familiar with combinatorics, however, are immediately going to recognize that it doesn't take very many distinct elements before the number of possible contingencies and configurations among them becomes enormous. One doesn't need Avogadro's number, 10 to the 23rd. One doesn't need billions. One doesn't need millions of molecules. Truth of the matter is, only about 80 will suffice. Because the number of combinations of, of 80 distinct things with themselves scales roughly as 80 factorial, 80 multiplied by 79 by 78 and so forth down to 1, which comes out to be about 10 to the 116th power, which is about a million times bigger than an enormous number. What this says is if you get, if, if you get 80 things that are arbitrarily, uh, distinct things that are arbitrarily in configuration, uh, the chances are about 1 in 10 to the minus 110 16 seconds, uh, 116th, that it will ever reoccur again. In other words, it's not going to occur again in 1 million repetitions of the, uh, the known universe. Now, in ecosystems like I deal with, uh, we deal commonly with hundreds or thousands of organisms, each of which can be distinguished one from another. As a result, ecologists are awash in unique events. They're everywhere, all over the place, all the time, at all scales. In the face of such a situ situation, determinism as a universal characteristic of nature becomes almost an absurdity. Now, a necessary condition for applying probability theory to chance events is that those events occur at least several times so that a legitimate estimate of a frequency can be estimated. Singular events, however, occur only once and never more. So there's no way that you can legitimately talk about a probability or estimate a probability of, of saying, oh, okay, you can, you can estimate it. It gives you a number, but that number has no relationship to physical reality, according to Elsass's arguments. Now, I also want to lay particular stress that these singular events constitute actual holes or gaps in the causal fabric. Okay, they're like, they're like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It isn't something that we need to explain. It's something that cannot be explained. It's a fundamental aspect of the world around us because of the richness, the fecundity of the world in which we live. So, first we dispense with the possibility of laws. Now we're confronted with the inadequacy of, inadequacy of, of, uh, of probability theory and you're saying, hey, this is going in a bad direction. Is he up here in some sort of an anti-scientific diatribe? No, no, far from it. Uh, of course, you can point out to me that, that, that lots of biological reality, uh, biological situations occur with sufficient regularity. What might account, if not laws, what might account for such regularities? Now, I would like to suggest to you two agencies that, uh, from which we can get such regularity in such a, uh, a rich and, and, and uneven world. The first of these is that patterns are being created and maintained by processes. And the outcomes of processes are indeterminate. Now, what am I talking about when I talk about a process? Let me give you a useful, very artificial experience, uh, example of a process. And it's called Polya's urn, named after the mathematician Polya. The idea here is that we have an urn 
here that you can't see inside of. And we put a red ball in the urn and we put a blue ball in the urn and we shake it up, okay? On one side, I got a pile of red balls. On the other side, I got a pile of blue balls, okay? And I blindly pick out a ball. If it's a red ball, I take one of the other red balls and put two of them back in, and we shake it up and draw again. If I should draw a blue ball, I take another one of the blue balls and put it back into the thing, shake it up, and, uh, and draw again. Now, the first question is, after a thousand draws, does the ratio of red balls to blue balls in the urn become almost constant or, or, or approach a constant? And the answer is, yes, it does. It's not 0.5 all the time. It might be something like, uh, oh, I don't know, 0.4697315 or something like that. Now, second thing. Suppose we take all the balls out, separate them and put them back, and then redo the experiment. Second question is, will the process converge to the same limit? You can show this either empirically or you can easily, easily program it and show that no, it won't. The next time, it may converge to 0.813674 or something like that. What one discovers is that the ratio of the balls is, becomes progressively constrained by the particular series of the draws, especially the first several draws, to converge upon a certain, uh, a certain number. Furthermore, if you keep on doing this process over and over and over again, what you'll discover is that the ratios are uniformly distributed over the interval, open interval 0, 1. What that means is that you have a probability of getting any fraction between 0 and 1 in any, any particular uh, thing. So what you've got here is some very hard and fast rules, and yet you have a very indeterminate outcome. Now, before proceeding, I want to draw your attention to at least three aspects of Polya's process, okay? Number one, it involves chance. Number two, it involves self-reference, okay? Our probability of what we choose depends upon the ratio that's currently in there. And number three, the history of the draws is crucial to where it converges, okay? Those three things, chance, self-reference, and history. It's helpful also to note that, uh, uh, that a scientific law is really a limiting form of, uh, of, of one of these processes. Uh, in those instances where, where the process occurs, uh, converges to something very near one or very near zero, uh, if you graph out the ratio, it looks almost like a law with a few little ticks on it and so forth. Okay? So its behavior becomes indistinguishable from the action of a law in extreme conditions. More generally, however, processes are more indeterminate in their outcome. Karl Popper also noted that physical forces were limiting forms of what he called, more generally, propensities. Now, in his lexicon, a propensity was a tendency for a certain event to occur in a particular context. And uh, such a tendency or propensity is related to, but not equivalent to, conditional probabilities. Let me see if I can give a, a little bit of an idea, a feel for what a propensity is. Okay, let's look at a table of events. Okay, now here uh, uh, across the, the top are B1 through B5, and these are certain results. And down the, 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 the column to the left are A1 through A4. Uh, these are eliciting uh, causes or something like that. And uh, when we look at it, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the outcomes might be, for example, you know, forms of cancer of the, the lung, stomach, pancreas, kidney, skin, or something like that. Whereas the eliciting causes might be uh, habits like running, smoking, eating fats, uh, sunbathing, etc., etc. And uh, if, you, if you collected data on, on cases so on pathology and related them to, to habits, this is generally something of what you might get. In ecology, for example, uh, the, top could, the top row could be uh, predators, or, you know, what's going out there eating the prey, which are the, uh, the A1 through the A4, so that uh, we can see that uh, B3, uh, uh, in this thousand, thousand feeding events, uh, B3 ate uh, A3 38 times, for example. Okay, one notes now that uh, whenever condition A1 prevails, uh, there's a propensity for B2 to occur. Whenever A2, then, then B5 is most likely. 
the situation is a little ambiguous with A3. Uh, you have uh, uh, B1 and B4 more likely, but uh, there's a little bit of scatter in there and so forth. And then you have these sort of outliers, what Popper calls interferences like uh, A1B3 and uh, A3B5. Popper says that these are due to interferences. Okay? Now, this is because of the way Popper is thinking. Popper is thinking about physical laws that are somehow being uh, disrupted and intervened by external circumstances, okay? So it's almost like noise being projected externally upon, upon laws. But what we've just seen from Elsasser is that there's another interpretation possible here, and that is that the heterogeneity itself, that when you have two things interacting with another, you, you, you always get to scatter. Uh, you get a propensity if, you know, if A1, B2, if A3, B2. Most of the time, but every, one, every once in a while, if A1, then A5. Okay. Outliers. Now, I have, I have no idea whether Papa or Elsass were, were aware of each other's existence and so forth. Now, Popper thought that if one could effectively constrain and isolate the propensities from each other, then you would get something very much like a determinate physical law, okay? If one, always B2. If A2, always B5. If A3, always B1, etc., etc. So this is his sort of scenario of what you'd get if you were able to go to the laboratory and totally constrain things with clones and etc., etc. Uh, Notice about this that uh, before never occurs, okay? Uh, it's entirely possible, uh, as Popper says, that uh, uh, before is the result of a combination of interactions of propensities. That propensities never occur in isolation, they always occur in a context, and that context always includes other propensities. Now, for future reference, I want to note how the transition from A1 to A2 is from less constrained, less well organized, to more constrained, more highly organized. In my lexicon, I call that higher ascendancy. And if we had time and if we had a mathematical audience, I'd, I'd, I'd try to quantify this particular tendency. Uh, tendency. But now, now the onus is on me to try to identify a process in nature that will cause this transition from table one to two, table two, to, to cause things to become more constrained and more organized. To do this, I turn back to Bateson, whom I mentioned earlier in my talk, because I think it was part of Bateson's genius to notice that regularity could be imparted to nature via feedback. He said that the outcome of random noise acting upon a feedback circuit is generally non-random. Now, now, I now draw your attention to a subclass of feedback uh, configurations called autocatalysis. By autocatalysis, I mean here an instance of positive feedback where each step is always positive, okay? The idea here is that in this little three, without loss of generality, the uh, 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 three, uh, three element cycle, uh, if there's an increase in the activity of A1, then there is a propensity for B2 to increase. Notice I said propensity, not I didn't say mechanically makes B2. If B, B increases, there's a propensity for C to increase, and C increases, there's a propensity for A to increase, and so forth. Uh, what's an example of this in nature? Well, my favorite one from ecology uh, evolves around the, uh, the genus Utricularia. Some of you may know it as bladderwort. It's a, it's a pond weed, if you will, that you find in, in ponds virtually throughout the United States, the various things. Um, the idea here is that uh, along the feathery leaves of these pond weeds are these little, uh, these little utricle. They look almost like small snails, but they're not. They're literally attached to the plant, and they're part of the plant. And if you look at them, as in the, uh, uh, the expansion to the right, uh, what you find is at the end of each of these utricles there are little hairs, so that if you have a small animal like Daphnia or these little uh, uh, isopod or whatever it is that's swimming around, if they touch the hair, the, there's an opening that opens up and there's a negative pressure, a negative osmotic pressure inside the that sucks them in. 
just sort of like you know, Venus flytrap only a different mechanism, okay? Uh, and then it closes and assimilates the, uh, uh, the, the, the organism. Now, this is actually a, a positive feedback loop, just like A, B, and C, because if you, if you look at utricularia out in the wild, it always has its accoutrement of a slimy algal film called periphyton that grows very quickly on their surface. This slimy film attracts these little animals who come and chomp down on it, okay? And every once in a while, they bump into a utricle, and they are eaten by the plant, okay? The plant matrix helps the... the uh, uh, the paraphyton, the paraphyton gives food to the animals, the animals gives food to the plant, and so forth. Now, in chemistry, where reactants are simple and fixed, autocatalysis is just a simple mechanism. But, as soon as you get to a situation where one or more of the participants uh, can have incremental alterations, they're malleable, you know, small adjustments and so forth, then the action of autocatalysis, I say, I maintain, can become highly non-mechanical. I, I, in my book, I outline eight attributes of, of autocatalysis, and I don't have uh, uh, time to discuss them all, but of primary importance is that of selection. Okay? Uh, suppose there's a small change in category B. Suppose that change is such that it makes it more sensitive to A, or uh, a better catalyst of C, or both. If that's the case, then suddenly it's going to propagate around the loop and it's going to start receiving more stimulus from C. It's self-rewarding. Conversely, if something happens to be that, that decrements its action in the loop, that means it makes it less sensitive to A or a poor catalyst of C, then suddenly it's going to start receiving less from C. Okay? So there's a, a preferred direction, if you will, uh, an asymmetry uh, in this, this action of autocatalysis. Furthermore, as components increasingly engage in autocatalysis, they mutually adapt to the cycle to such an extent that they may lose the capability of surviving on their own, just like B4 did in our, in our matrix back there. And should they be separated from the cycle and still survive, they may act very differently from how they act within the, uh, uh, the, the feedback loop. So that is, this, the, the full cycle manifests an organic nature that belies the assumption of atomism. Now, one notes in particular that any change in B is likely to involve a change in the amounts of material and energy that come in to sustain it. These things don't exist in, in, in a vacuum and so forth. They need matter and energy to, to keep the processes going. So, the argument is, what happens if there's a change in B that brings in more matter that, hel that helps it to, to, to act fast? Well, it'll be rewarded. Conversely, if something happens and it can't bring as much in, it'll be decremented, just as we said before. But this, this, this refers not only to B, but to C and to A as well. And the result is what I call centripetality, that the selection pressure in autocatalysis is such that it always, it always selects for things that can pull more material and energy into it. It's, it's centripetal. Rather than centrifugal flying apart and going away, it's pulling things in. It is difficult to overstate the importance of centripetality to the phenomenon of life. And probably in all the definitions of life, you've never heard of centripetality. Maybe not. Anyway. Uh, Conventional Darwinism, for example, it overlooks the nature of striving. Okay? We know that uh, in Darwinism that, that animals compete, and this is all true. Okay? I'm, not, I'm not debunking Darwinism. This is all true, that these animals compete. And you get a bunch of students, and you, and you ask them, and I say, why are they competing? And you know, usually they're lost for an answer. Well, uh, all of the various organisms are engaged in epic struggle with each other in red and tooth and claw. How do we, demyst how do we demystify Darwinism? Well, here's what Bertrand Russell says on the topic. He says that every living thing is a sort of an imperialist, seeking to transform as much as possible of its environment into itself and into its seed. 
we may regard the whole of evolution, that I emphasize this, as flowing from this chemical imperialism, a very didactic term, a living matter. Okay? It's clear that by chemical imperialism, Russell is identifying centripetality. Now, Darwinism considers competition to be the core of, of evolution, whereas uh, Russell is saying, well, no, it's actually centripetality, and centripetality first depends upon mutualism, autocatalysis. Okay? So, competition is corollary to mutualism. That's a very heterodox statement. It's heterodox scientifically, it's heterodox socially. Okay, but I'll repeat it again. Competition is contingent upon and corollary to mutualism. You don't have competition without mutualism somewhere else. Now, it may not be at the same level. It may and usually is at the level below, but it's always contingent. Now, suppose, for example, that uh, we have our, our cycle A, B, and C, and suppose D comes around, and suppose D is uh, more sensitive to A and a better catalyst of C. Well, the ensuing dynamics will be such that, that D will tend to push B out of the picture, be, re, be replaced by, uh, uh, by D. Of course, if that can happen to B, it can happen to C and A, and we start out with A, B, C, and we wind up with D, E, F which says that the characteristic lifetime of the configuration of processes is longer than any of its constituent uh, participants. Okay? Furthermore, it exerts selection pressure on those constituents. Now, sort of a corollary of that, uh, you could think, instead of some strange new D, uh, suppose B is, is somehow in, 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 uh, impaired, uh, and then there's a B prime that's almost like B. Well, it could then, it could then loop B, B prime into the loop. So the system can repair itself via the same tendency, if you will. Okay. So we start out with ABC, we wind up with D, E, and F. And I, you say, that's kind of strange, but really it's not. I mean, uh, look, in the world, look in the room around you, okay? We're all sitting there, and none of us is cellularly the same people we were seven years ago. Well, with the exception of a lot of neurons, but, you know, skin, liver, stomach, you name it, they're all different cells than they were seven years ago. Uh, molecularly, in terms of atoms, we're not this, uh, hardly any atoms in our body now that were there 18 months ago. Just a very, very tiny fraction. And yet, and yet if we walk into a room uh, and, and, and our mother sees us for the first time in 10 years, she'll recognize us. We hope. Um, so that it's, 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 it's really a very, very natural thing. Moreover, I think we can show that autocatalytic selection sometimes acts to stabilize, compartmentalize, and regularize behaviors across the hierarchy of scales. Unlike the rigidity of the Newtonian universality, in the Newtonian world, if one molecule swirls, the whole thing comes apart, okay? In this, in this process of interaction between uh, chance and autocatalysis, an event anywhere, a perturbation anywhere, almost never propagates all the way up and down the hierarchy. It's all, it, it usually is selected out at some point up the hierarchy, or it may have difficulty going down the hierarchy because of energy densities uh, getting too great. So that, so that perturbations don't propagate everywhere, they're compartmentalized, if you will. Uh, the action of process on nature induces it to take on habits and exhibit regularities, but the effects of this are limited in time and space. So the universality of Newtonian laws is replaced by what we in ecology call a granularity of the world, the idea that processes, which are the substitutes for law, exist only in a limited, space of, limited realm of space and time. Okay? Not universality, but granularity. Please note also how autocatalytic selection pressure that drives centripetality is exerted top 
down that prohibited direction. Okay? It's an agency proper to the macroscopic ensemble that actively influences and selects among its constituent elements. Not only does this action contradict the Newtonian prescription against closure, number four, okay, but it also reveals that the real agency behind the creation of new objects is not another object. Rather, it is a configuration of processes. Now, Karl Popper, when this light dawned on him, exalted. He suddenly said, Heraclitus was right. We are not things. We are not static things, but we're like flames. Or a little more prosaically, we are like all cells, processes of metabolism, nets of chemical pathways. This view that configurations of processes constitute the proper agencies in living systems I have called, coined the name, process ecology. Enzo Tietze, Tietze the, the, the Italian thermodynamicist, provided an example of how configurations of processes are totally central to life. Because you don't hear about this too much whenever, whenever anyone defines life, okay? He asked, he asked his readers to consider a dead deer. You know, he's in the Italian countryside, he sees a deer, he shoots it, and the deer dies. Um, and he says, look at this dead deer, what's, what's there? It has the same mass, it has the same uh, bound energy, it has the same genomes, it has the same microscopic structure, it has almost the same macroscopic structure, except for the bullet hole in its head or whatever it is. It's virtually the same thing. What's missing? The configuration of metabolic processes that kept it alive. Okay? If the sudden absence of a configuration of processes leads to a cessation of life, the obverse is true that, that configurations can also mediate the emergence of new forms of life. And this has been a major conundrum in the Newtonian system. Because in an unchanging world, how can you accommodate true change, true qualitative change? This mystery, however, simply vanishes in process ecology. The autocatalytic con uh, configuration of processes is constantly being impacted by a vast stream of singular events, these unique events that I was talking about earlier. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, by virtue of its coherence, it's simply indifferent to the vast majority of them. They don't make, they don't make a, a hill of beans difference in the configuration. A very small minority might impact it negatively, and the system will have to reconfigure and respond in some way uh, that becomes part of its history and maybe will help it respond to a rep repetition of that particular impact. In even rarer circumstances, you might get uh, a unique configuration which just sort of, sort of uh, fits hand and glove or lock and key with the, the particular sensitive nodes of that, that network of, of process such as that it pushes it in to a qualitatively new mode of behavior. Okay? The idea here is that emergence is totally natural to process ecology. The, it was an enigma in the Newtonian world. It's totally natural in process ecology. But a price must be paid for accepting this open universe, okay? The idea that there are gaps in the fabric of causality. And uh, uh, the big price in that is you have, to, you have to part company with a possibility of ultimate control over nature. Ultimate knowledge, scienta potenta est. Ultimate knowledge is ultimate control, okay? We have to do away with determinism. Uh, but there's simply no alternative to this, okay? With all due apologies to Arthur Eddington, a physicist very interested in the second law, I would like to rephrase an idea by Karl Popper. It's a rather long one. He, if someone points out to you that your pet theory of evolution is in disagreement with Fisher's equations, these are equations of genes and so forth, and so much the worse for Fisher's equations, 
And if your theory contradicts the facts, well, sometimes these experimentalists bungle things. But if your theory cannot accommodate gaps in the causal structure of living systems, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it but to fall grievously short of providing a full knowledge of how living systems evolve. Now, in case you haven't been keeping account with me, uh, along with me, I note that the action of singular chance upon autocatalytic configurations has been shown to violate all five of the Newtonian postulates. To put it bluntly, the remnants that we all cling to of the Newtonian metaphysic are wholly inappropriate to the description of living dynamics. It is necessary to identify an entirely new but, whole, uh, but, but wholly naturalistic metaphysic, an ecological metaphysic, if you will. But where to begin? Well. Let's go back. Remember when I talked about the polya process? I, I, I asked you to note three things about it. Okay? Namely, that it required chance, self-reference, and history. Okay? These are going to be the three new postulates on which we're going to build uh, the, uh, the description of life. The first of these is radical contingency. Nature, in its complexity, is rife with singular events. Most do not upset existing prevailing regularities, but a very few occasionally carry a system into wholly different modes of emergent behavior. This is the antithesis of determinism. Okay? Now, the second one involves how systems can maintain their integrities and grow. At its root, we identified autocatalytic action, which is a particular form of self-influence. Okay, so my statement is, a process in nature, via its interaction with other natural processes, can influence itself. Can influence itself. This can happen all at the same level. Okay? This is violating closure. It says you don't have to go down and back up. You may even be able to go up and back down. Of course, you say, oh, this is just feedback. We all know about feedback. And that's true. But we all know about feedback. In the, in the context of atomism, and I'm going to drop atomism. That's something new. Okay? Thirdly, the system must retain some record of its past configurations or a history. The effects of self-influence are usually constrained by the accumulation of past such changes as recorded in configurations of the, living, of the living matter. Now, such configurations we immediately tend to think of as being, you know, the genome, the DNA, and so forth. But I, I would suggest to you also, you could think of them in terms of configurations of processes, a little bit more abstract and hard to put your hand around, but, but very natural, none of you before. Note also how the end point of this tendency, as Popper intuitive, is an evolutionary dead end. No further change is possible. It is further noteworthy how physicists and cosmologists have begun to converge upon the dynamics of processes that brought the universe into existence. After that initial Big Bang, subtle asymmetries in the initial medium led to the self-selection of various enduring forms out of an initial homogeneous substrate. And with them appear certain regularities and their interactions, the various particles of nature and their interactions. The forms and interactions grew quite precise and stable, and the physical world with its accompanying laws eventually took shape. In other words, the stable material forms and the inexorable laws that we see in the physical realm are the final results of a more fundamental process, one that corresponds very nicely with the ecological metaphysic. Yet we are constantly being asked to explain the origin of life by starting with dead forms. Somehow, we have this idea that if we can only get the form of material right, if only we can create that, that somehow they're going to jump up and dance and be alive, just like Ezekiel's dry bones are going to put on flesh and dance for us. And that's what we're being asked to do for the most part in the origin of life. And that's contrary, in the opposite direction of what I've been explaining to you. A more natural way is 
to go with the flow, if you will. It's to reverse the direction and begin with a configuration of physical and chemical processes, a proto-ecosystem, if you will. Howard Odom, uh, one of my gurus, gave me the tie I'm wearing and so forth, uh, his scenario was that a proto-ecosystem had to be in place before you could get the first before you could get the first organism. Okay, what he, what he thought about was that you had to have two opposing chemical reactions like oxidation or reduction and one had to play, take place some part in space where it could take up energy and the other had to take place in another part of space where it could offload that energy in low, low form entropy as it's called and furthermore these two parts of space had to be connected somehow by physical transport, you know, like the flow of a gas or, or a fluid or something like that. A proto-ecosystem, if you will. Okay? We already have the animation. Already it is in place. And now we can envision, we can envision just like you have big eddies and turbulence and they, they break apart and make little eddies, we can envision this big configuration of, uh, of processes spawning off smaller ones. And there's nothing, nothing mysterious about that. In, prior, in, in, in thermodynamics, processes engender other processes all the time. And, and, and they spin off uh, other cycles all the time. It's a very natural thing to occur. There's no particular enigma in any of this. John Corliss, a, a colleague of mine, has suggested that such an area, a scenario might have been played out at the Archaean Thermal Springs down in the, uh, uh, in the deep sub subterranean vents where you have exactly this scenario. You have uh, uh, chemotrophic events at the bottom and then, uh, and then you have offloading the energy at the top and there's continual advection and, and diffusion between them. And, and, that's becoming now a more plausible scenario amongst the origin of life people like Harold Morowitz and Robert Hazen. So, process ecology, the notion that objects are created by configurations of processes, provides a far more consistent framework for supporting the origin of life. Now, many object to the scenario of process ecology uh, as being too complicated to pass the test of Occam's razor. You know what Occam's razor is, it's the, the simpler explanation always has the advantage. Okay? And there's no denying that, that, that Darwinian, uh, Darwinian selection is an extremely simple dynamic. It's so simple that people are out there applying it in so many places where even it's not applicable. Okay? Uh, in contrast, this business of autocatalysis uh, with, with, uh, with, with chance is a little bit more complicated. And what we're being asked to do, however, is to concentrate on the dynamic. The physicists, however, tell us that, that the full statement of the problem is not just the dynamics, but it's also the particularities, the boundary conditions, okay? And what are the boundary conditions in the Darwinian scenario? Well, it's something called natural selection. And what is natural selection? It's anything out there that might, that might uh, uh, upset the system or impact the system or cause it to, to grow better. It's infinitely complicated. So the, 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 the description of the, of the Darwinian system is actually extremely complicated. Now, now, okay, the dynamics of process ecology is slightly more complicated, but selection has been internalized. And by the act of inter some of it, not all of it, some of it still exists. Selection has been internalized. And by internalizing that selection, we simplify the specification of the boundary problem quite a bit. We simplify it more than compensatory for the slight increase in the difficulty of the dynamics. So the overall problem statement of process ecology, I would contend, is actually simpler. What shows you, if you're going to use Occam's razor, you better beware, you can cut yourself. It's a double-edged blade. Okay, let me summarize. I'm, I'm, you know, I know you're all anxious to get out and get into the sunshine if it's still there and so forth. Uh, it helps with this, uh, for me to, to summarize some of what has been, been said here. Uh, I've suggested to you that a more encompassing narrative can be formulated by expanding the character of agencies at work in nature from forces 
to propensities, and by generalizing the constraints under which they operate from laws to processes. And we see that much, if not most, of the agency at work in living systems are configurations of processes rather than objects. In doing so, we've formulated a metaphysic that is both simpler than and diametrically counter to our legacy from the Enlightenment. From a cosmological point of view, we see that process ecology is more fundamental than the material endpoints that such evolution has engendered. We have demystified Darwinism by providing an agency behind the ubiquitous striving and competition of living beings and shown how new forms and behaviors can emerge naturally, including the beginnings of life. Furthermore, our narrative has remained entirely within the confines of methodological naturalism. Nothing I've said here, no recourse, has been made to the transcendental. There is nothing whatsoever that should keep a principled metaphysical naturalist, I'm sure there are many of you here in the, uh, from accepting what I have said. And I hope, I, I hope I've made that abundantly clear in the citations that I've made, which are mostly from metaphysical naturalists and so forth. And, and I share these, these views with uh, any number of colleagues who are committed to naturalism. So one would think that I should be pretty optimistic about my acceptance of process ecology by the larger body of scientists. Well, unfortunately, a reluctant pessimism would probably better describe how I feel about it. And the, the reasons why I feel that way are actually twofold. I anticipate a rather strong and vociferous uh, 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 rejection and resistance to what I have said for two, two reasons. The first of these was, is expressed in a very long but, but didactic fashion by the, by the evolutionary biologist Richard Lowenton. And he said, we take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to the material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. In short, to adopt the process ecology and the ecological metaphysic, the materialist will not have to abandon his or her, his, his or her beliefs, but will have to modify them somewhat. Okay? Uh, uh, one must abandon the idea that material and efficient causality always co-occur and must fall back to the early Aristotelian form of material and efficient causality where the material cause was always necessary it couldn't, things couldn't happen without the material, but it was passive to something that was efficient. You know, like in the building of a house, you have lumber, bricks, and cement, and whatnot. Uh, that's the material cause, but they're sort of passive in the hands of the workers that put them together. Okay? So we have to forego talk about genes directing development and shift instead, shift shift one's emphasis instead towards the network of protein and enzyme processes and reactions that actually read, select, edit the genome, and then implement the subsequent development activity. As my colleague and materialist Stan Salty defined it for me personally, and it's a little hard, so I'm going to read it, Materialism is the often covert reliance upon the inherent properties of material substances to foster models that do not explicitly refer to them, but which would fail without their implicit presence. That is, material continues to act and exert direct influence, but at levels far removed from the scale at which the relevant explanation occurs. The second the second reason 
follows from the very next sentence by Lowenton. It's very simply it says, moreover, that materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. A divine foot? There's not even a divine toenail clipping in process ecology. So it's, it's necessary to be a little bit more precise. And uh, fortunately, the physicist Leonard Susskind uh, wrote in The Edge, which Dr. Bristol mediates, and so he gave us a little bit more precise clue as to what was at stake here. He says that from a, pol he was talking about la the new landscape theory in physics, which is something a bit different than this, but there are some overlap. He says, from a political cultural point of view, it's not that these arguments are religious, but that they denude us from our historical strength in opposing religion. Aha, there's the rub. Indeed, there have been several issues concerning the natural world that have divided the theists from the secularists, like the existence of free will, imminent divine action, God's work in the world, if you will, the, eff the efficacy of prayer. Is it even possible? Can, can God somehow intervene and listen to prayers? There's the challenge of theodicy, you know, the question of evil in the world and so forth. And the Newtonian metaphysic has often been invoked to reject the theistic positions on these positions, on these questions. Under process ecology, it becomes a bit harder to renounce theistic beliefs. Not that theistic propositions perforce follow from it. No, they don't. Although I, I might make the, I might make the, the philosophical uh, argument that I think free will might follow logically from it. But rather, the scenario of an open world requires each individual to choose whether or not to terminate the nexus of causality behind any one or combination of singular events. And of course, these singular events occur once, and you miss it, and you've, that's it. Okay? No test is possible after the fact to validate your decision. It's as if a veil, an epistemological veil of ambiguity descends upon it that, does, that, 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 that keeps the theist and the, the agnostic from, from destroying one another's arguments. It becomes undecidable. Now, it's important to bear in mind that the Newtonian consensus precipitated in an era of overweening clericalism. Uh, and this is really bad. I mean, out of fear, some formulators of, of, the, of the early scientific principles were keen to separate their activities from the supernatural. Very keen, because if they didn't do so, they're liable to be excommunicated or exterminated. Uh, you know, hung, burned at the stake, etc., etc. Others sought aggressively to undermine the authority of the clerics. And the common cause of both of these groups was to somehow majorly separate their activities from the supernatural. And they created a chasm, a chasm between them. A chasm so deep and so wide that it swallowed up the living world. The result is that we have inherited what Paul Tillich has called an ontology of death, from which we have seen it has become nearly impossible to make the transition into a full understanding of the phenomenon of life. But the circumstances of the 17th and 18th centuries no longer prevail, in Western society at least. It's not religious clerics who are impeding our pathway to a richer understanding of life. As the agnostic Bateson implied, it seems to be the self-ordained high priests of scientific orthodoxy who cling rigidly to ideas that point us diametrically in the wrong direction. Science, however, is a legacy of all humanity, agnostics and theists alike. It's high time that all concerned with scientists realize that one can nowhere escape the action of belief, and that belief perforce implies radical uncertainty, as Ilya Prigogine said. Scientific discussion is not the place for ideology, tacit or overt. It is the theater in which to observe, and at times possibly improve upon, the all-consuming play of life. So in closing, I'd like to submit to you that process ecology is a more neutral and less ideological theater in which to look at life. 
It replaces a, a Sisyphusian, if I can pronounce that word right, struggle to conjure up life from dead materials with a direct approach that parallels and goes with the flow of the larger evolutionary drama playing, being played out in the cosmos. It constitutes an ontology of life that allows one to focus on the true agencies that have formed who we are and where we are going. I thank you kindly for your attention. How do you apply your work towards the ecology of Chesapeake Bay? <laughs> Very good. You know, I really didn't say much about, about what I do. Uh, remember, uh, Bateson really wasn't too concerned in solving the ecological problems. He was interested in an ecological frame of mind. That's what I've talked about tonight. But how did I get into all of this, okay? Um, I got into it by representing ecosystems as networks, okay? Boxes and arrows connected up, uh, boxes connected up with arrows. The idea of uh, who eats whom and by how much, if you will, okay? If you have striped bass out here eating uh, manidia, sort of a saltwater minnow, then that represents a flow of carbon from the manidia to the striped bass. And you can, you can look at all the possible combinations of predators and prey, and and create a network, okay? And what, I, what I've really done has been to use mathematical uh, uh, methods to, to do a number of things, to look at indirect actions, to identify uh, cycles, you know, I referred to cycling within the system, and to be able to quantify the degree of development uh, that the system is at, so that if you have a major, per, major perturbation, we can go back and remeasure the network and tell whether the system has really decreased in organization or increased in organization, okay? And it was in the process of creating these networks and working with them that, that, that I discovered this idea of increasing ascendancy, and I couldn't relate that to, to any reductionistic hypotheses. And I said, well, maybe the cause is right here in the configuration of processes. But uh, uh, what we've done uh, with these networks in a very practical sense has been to show where some of the weak links are, where some of the major players are, uh, where some of the, the, the uh, you know, like oysters and the, 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 the disappearance of oysters, for example, and how that has affected uh, the system in, 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 in so many places. Uh, um, but I, I haven't emphasized that, that, that practical nature of my work in my talk tonight. Do you think that the change in perspective is a result of the new language that math has? You know, because now with modern computers, we can, the language that mathematicians work in can be more computational as opposed to having to be these you know, fixed sentences. Yeah, well, for one thing, you can have free agent models, you know, as they have, or individual-based models, as they're called. Um, but also, there's this matter of scientific style. Now, ecologists have been working with networks for 60 years, over 60 years now, since 1943. Uh, some of the first networks were, quantified networks were put together. Uh, and we've developed uh, uh, a, a lot of, uh, um, of, of of analytical tools that we can bring to bear on them. But we're not physicists, so we don't command respect of science and nature and whatnot. It just so happens that physicists have suddenly discovered networks uh, in the late 90s. Uh, you know, you've probably heard about you know, power law distributions. We knew that 10 years before Barabesi and so forth talked about it in nature and science, but hey, you know. We're ecologists and, and physicists don't. So, so there's this, this matter of scientific fashion. And yes, in fact, scientific fashion, fashion is leaning in the direction of networks. And uh, uh, we're hearing lots and lots now about networks, but very little bit about causality in networks, which is you know, where this has pushed me. Sir. Um, yes. I, I had a question earlier. Uh, if the Big Bang didn't occur, would there still be such a thing as enormous numbers? <laughs> well, in other words, if we were, uh, if we were just there without an expansion, if we just lived in a static universe but the same number of, of particles, uh, as a matter of fact, there probably would be. I mean, the, 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 the calculation depends only on the age of the universe. Uh, if the age then would be infinite, then yeah, you, 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 I guess you're probably right. Then there wouldn't be a threshold of enormous numbers. The object that, 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 that Elsasser was trying to 
uh, to get at here is that, is that we live in a bounded universe by and large, at least, we, at least as far as we can see, okay? I mean, in landscape theory, they're talking about multitudes of them out there beyond what we can see. But, but we can deal only with what we can see, and that's our physical reality. That's where we were born into. It is finite, and we can therefore create this threshold. But you, you know, you've got a good point there. If it, were, if it were an endless, infinite universe and not expanding, then uh, it would be harder to, harder to, to talk about enormous numbers. Uh, yes, so, it seems to me that your, one of your major thrusts tonight um, is uh, coming up with a different mechanism for evolution than the neo-Darwinian. And I'm still uh, kind of mulling over how your process produces new species. I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. Okay, two things. First of all, use the word mechanism, and as those who know me will know, I, I'm, I'm rather averse to the use of the term mechanism, uh, not because I don't believe that there are mechanisms out there in the world, but just because I think it's wholly overused, okay? So that uh, this really isn't a mechanism more than it is a process. Uh, I, I, I really should have done this. I was given a... Uh, 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 I was given a T-shirt one time, and some of you may have seen it. It has a cartoon from the New York Maga New Yorker magazine, and it has these two scientists at a blackboard, and there's a whole bunch of equations at the top, and a whole bunch of equations uh, down at the bottom, and one fellow's holding the chalk. Uh, and in the middle it says, and then a miracle happens. And the second scientist says, I think you need to clarify point B a little more. Uh, I, I, I say that because, because the type of emergence that I'm talking about is what, is what uh, Philip Clayton and Gregory Peterson have called radical emergence, okay? The idea is that literally, literally, there is a gap in the, in the cause that a, a, a singular event occurs, a singular event in such a combination that just happens to, 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 to coincide, to find the tumblers in the safe, if you will, uh, to push the system into a radically different way. Okay, so, uh, and, and, and it's, you, can, you can easily say, well, hey, that's not an explanation at all. And in the classical sense, it is not. And what I'm maintaining is, that's how I think reality is, and I think we've got to come to live with it. We've got to come to terms with the gaps in, in, in nature. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for being here. I I uh, classify a good lecture on how long I think I'm going to be up at night thinking about things, and I think this is a one o'clock problem. Uh, <laughs> Mike, I, what I want to do conceptually is see if I understand what you're talking about, about the processes. And to do that, I'd like to do it, reduce it to a very simple two processes. One, the tendency of the carbon atom to combine with other atoms and the fact that in a temperature gradient you have a cycle going. And from what I recall of the original experiments to create life in the, in the, in the lab, they had carbon atoms and, or a soup and heat. But it didn't, it, I, as far as I can remember, it wasn't the process. Yeah. And so am I understanding you correctly that that, and so that if, if there's a change in one of the elements for example, if there's a solar flare and the temperature gradient changes, it becomes cooler or hotter, mm -hmm. then you might have a different um, autocatalytic uh, uh, process going because some other atom may be combining more efficiently. Am I understanding correctly? Yes, yes, absolutely. And the, the idea is that if you, if, that we can't, we really shouldn't try to envision the beginning of a life without animation already being there. Right animation in the physical sense already in place. And then, as you've mentioned, of course, the nice thing about the carbon molecule, and, and Harold Morowitz goes into this uh, about how, you know, carbon is so very nicely situated and whatnot, to create manifold combinations, that gives you the, the flexibility, uh, the, the fecundity, if you will, of possible configurations, so that you have so many configurations that there's more of a, more of a likelihood that some of them are gonna hook up in an autocatalytic uh, uh, fashion and sort of bleed some of this energy from the larger animation into a smaller, uh, into a smaller feedback loop, and that's the beginning of the organism if you will. That's, that's exactly what I'm saying. Thank you. Um, thank you. And so I was wondering, 
How do you think that ecology and science as a whole are going to change because of this? <laughs> well, you're, you know, you're going to get a biased answer from me, okay? Uh, I'm not sure ecology is going to change a whole lot. I think uh, the preponderance of my colleagues are still very much invested in the, the mechanical view of the world and in, in, in evolutionary theory and the, the neo-Darwinian synthesis. Uh, the title of my talk is Ecology, the Ascendant Perspective. And that's, that's a lot of hubris in that, okay? Uh, 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 I tend to think, just as, as Gregory Bateson did, that, that ecology is going to give us a new vision of how things are happening in this living world that will allow us, uh, that will allow us more scientific progress in directions that formerly could not have been thought of. I hope, that is my, that is my, 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 my very deep hope, but then again, that there's a little bit of ego involved in all of this, and, and it could very well happen that no change will happen, that people will say this is crazy, forget about it. Thank you. Thank you. Can you relate your, um, what do you call it, process theory to practical political views that could help preserve our, our environment that's constantly facing pressures from humanity? Oh boy. Um, I mean, you know, as I, as, I, as I mentioned earlier in the Chesapeake, you know, we, we can talk about networks and bring network uh, methodology to bear on, uh, uh, on environmental problems, but, but your question is a little deeper and I really haven't given that much thought. That's, that's, uh, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb with all of this and I, I think that if you go from the ontology of death, uh, uh, if you will, to the ontology of life, that gives you uh, a different, it causes you to value things differently. I'm not going to say better or worse, but differently, okay? So that uh, 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 it's harder to say things like, you know, it's just, um, just, just a hunk, you know, just, just, it's just a thing, it's just a machine, it's just a hunk of money. In medicine, maybe that's, maybe that's a good example. I mean, in medicine, we, we spend a lot of time looking for the silver bullet, the oncogene, or, the, uh, 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 or, or whatever, it is, or the germ, and we always look for a macroscopic thing. Uh, if, in fact, we looked rather at uh, the whole immune system as a system, we might treat cancer rather differently uh, and try to say, shock the immune system into a, into a configuration where it will just destroy the cancer by itself. So that, so that the idea is that, uh, and that's not an environment, uh, I, I, I grant you, that's medicine. Um, but I, I, I do think that if we, if we take this, this attitude, we, we are forced to look at the ecosystem as a whole. The, the whole ecosystem takes on an ontological reality, okay? Before, it was just something that we, we arbitrarily carved out, if you will. And now we look upon it as, as, as an interacting, integrated whole. And now our, our, our objects, our objectives, are different. We've got to preserve the functioning of everything uh, rather than just concentrating on, on the particular parts. I'm, 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 I'm thinking on my feet and, and, and probably uh, hyperventilating, but in any event, that's about as far as I can go with it all. Uh, yes, you briefly mentioned uh, granularity and how that uh, disrupted or uh, disproved a universality of Newtonian physics. I was wondering if you could uh, expand on that a bit. Okay. I didn't really say it, it disproved the, the universality of Newtonian physics. I said that the granularity does not, granularity applies to the processes in the biotic world. Now, having said that, having said that, I won't retreat entirely, okay? Um, Stephen Hawking, who, who talked to you all at one time and so forth, um, spent an awful part, awful long part of his scientific career trying to marry gravitation with quantum theory, okay? Now, if you look at Planck's constant, you look at the gravitational constant, you suddenly see that they're separated by 42 orders of magnitude. Now, I'm an engineer, okay? And, and when you have things that are separated by big orders of magnitude, you create dimensionless ratios, and those ratios tell you whether, whether it's worth, take, you know, worth keeping both of these into, in the problem. And, and what this would tell me as an engineer, you know, 42 orders of magnitude is no way 
maybe you're going to get them together. And, 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 and Dr. Hawking, who was an absolutely brilliant man, had to give up that, that, uh, uh, that quest about, uh, about a year and a half ago. And I, I suggested they to do so about nine years ago. So let's just say thank you. Yeah. Terry said, uh, uh, you know, I, I try not to express a lot of my inner things because in the scientific community, generally, if you express these things, you suddenly your credibility goes down to nothing. But here I am within 15 months of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of retiring. So, you know, it's, <laughs> it's uh, how has someone put it? It's something like uh, Giuseppe Bruno with tenure. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, are they going to burn me at the stake or what? But anyway, uh, you, know, you, don't, you haven't really made a reputation, so I don't have anything to lose, so you know, why not let it all hang out? Anyway, I'm, I'm here for questions. What are your theological views? <laughs> <laughs> rather, rather conventional, to be honest. I mean, you know, I, I'm a cradle Catholic, and uh, uh, I've, I've virtually always been one. And, and, and one of the things I feel very strongly about is post-Vatican II, at least, is the there's been, there's been more of an emphasis of, of, of the admixture of reason and faith. And it's, some, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a direction that I, I, I very much appreciate. Uh, but, you know, they're not, they're not very radical at all. Uh, and I'm very open uh, for interfaith dialogue. Uh, my wife runs a, a group, uh, my wife happens to have a, 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 a degree in theology. She just got it late in life after the kids went left, left and so forth. And, of course, we had these enormously long discussions about theology when she would come home from her, her lectures and so forth. And the kids, you know, they just hated it. You know, oh, this <laughs> mom and daddy are up there talking about religion again. <laughs> Give me a break. But, uh, uh, but, but no, they're, they're, they're rather conventional. And, you know, some of my favorite theologians are like Jack Haught of, uh, of Georgetown, uh, uh, who's written on Darwin. Uh, uh, what is it? Deeper than Darwin and God after Darwin and so forth. And, uh, I have some issues with him, but uh, um, Matthew uh, Fox. Matthew Fox. No, I'm. I'm, not, I'm I, 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 okay, I know of a fox it's in a, the origin of life, but topic. <laughs> okay. Well, I actually maintain. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, do you feel that it ultimately comes down to uh, sort of the human nature of the guardian? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm totally convinced. And I, you know, to tell you why I feel that way, you say, you know, why, you know, why God's so obscure? Why, why would God hide God's self and so forth? Uh, because I, I, I simply feel that to be very open and be very visible simply turns us into automatons, and we don't no longer have free will. Without free will, we cannot love. And and uh, you know, I mean, this is very Christian. You know, and the idea of Paul and the idea of God. God is love, and so forth. And love is the primary thing, um, and it all derives from that. Uh, yeah, you did get me drunk. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't be saying this. <laughs> yeah, I'm a psychologist by training, and right. you know, there is a tendency in psychology to 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 reduce and to show great faith in the biological explanations, but at the same time. Just as we do a reductionism, we do an expansionism, and we understand that there are processes that require more complex mm -hmm. explanations. And I thought it was a bit of a straw man that you gave us when you talked about science being so thoroughly reductionistic. And I'd like sure. to respect you on that. Sure. Sure. No, you're, okay, you're, well, except to, to, to admit that, yes, I do build straw man. Uh, the whole business yeah. of the Newtonian yeah. thing was a straw man. Uh, simply to pull it apart and so forth. And as I said, nobody really believes in all of that. And, and obviously not all, all scientists are reductionists and whatnot, uh, uh, but it's, 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 it's a rhetorical device getting the one's point across. Um, uh, you know, as far as, as, far as I, you know, I'm, I'm a total neophyte in terms of, of psychology and so forth, um, uh, I'm, I'm not too enamored of many of, of Freud's particular ideas, but the one thing that I do uh, respect him for is at least he was not reductionistic, uh, and you know he actually talked about uh, the psyche at the level of the human, uh, rather than 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 uh, uh, as always totally derivative of, of the molecules underneath. Uh, and I, 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 I sometimes worry. This is all on tape. I, I sometimes worry about the chemical nature of, of 
of psychiatric treatment today, and that you know it's all in a pill and whatnot, and the mother in law is a psychiatrist. And, but uh, um, well, enough, enough, I guess I've uh, enough rope okay, to hang myself. A, a quick question, which was if we want to reject sort of the simplistic Newtonian mechanics and X causes Y and Y causes Z, and we want to have a more systems approach, mm -hmm. how large does the system need to be? And at some point, right, the right. system is in the universe of possibilities. Okay. And okay. How do we define, how do we deal with very, it? Very, 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 very good question. I, I, I had thought about this. I'd come up with a notion known as the organic fold. Okay. The organic fold, F-O-L-D, and the fold is used in the mathematical sense of a catastrophe. Now, what is this all about? Where does reductionism work very well? Well, it does. There, you know, there's a, there's a part of reality where re reduction work, works very well. It's when you're, you're, uh, uh, it's when you can build upon the simplest, longest-lasting things, and you go down into the netherworld of of subatomic particles and so forth, and you begin to put them together into barons and atoms and molecules, et cetera, et cetera. And at each stage, at each stage, the combination uh, becomes more complex and more shorter lived, you know, more, more uh, 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 prone to, 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 to coming apart and so forth in a shorter lifetime. And because of that particular uh, confluence, uh, reductionism works well. Now, let's immediately go all the way up to the very top to ecological systems, to economic systems, uh, whatever it is, and so forth. And, and, and what do we notice there? In my talk, I talked about this, the, the idea that the, the pattern has a longer lifetime than the uh, constituents. It's also, when viewed at that level, simpler than the constituents, okay? I'm not, you know, I'm not saying don't look down through everything. It's obviously, it's always more complicated the higher you get, but look at it from the side, and what you discover is that ecosystems uh, are, are simply not as complex as the organisms that comprise them. They're not as, 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 strong, as, as mechanical, like strongly organized. They don't have a self-constructed uh, 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 surface. Uh, they don't have a programmatic uh, form of development, so forth, so that, so that the, the, the units are more complicated uh, as you go up. It's simpler and longer lived. And therefore, the, the, the direction of causality should be downward. So you've got this upward here and downward here. And the idea is you've got to go at least through an inversion or a maximum or you know, an hypothesizing a fold, a catastrophe. Okay? Now, where does the organic fold reside? And my guess, and it's just total speculation, is probably somewhere when you get to molecules with polymer size of about 40 or 50, and you say, why that? Well, it's because the same uh, uh, Elsass's argument uh, about uh, uh, the, the number of possible uh, uh, events in the world, scale that down a bit to the, to the, to the biosphere, okay? And if you scale it down to the biosphere, it works out instead of 80, it works out something like you know, 30 to 40. So, so my guess is that when you get the macromolecules of about 30 or 40, you've got enough, uh, enough uh, uh, distinction and enough flexibility so that, so that this whole process ecology I'm talking about can start up. That's perhaps a little bit too complicated of an answer. I mean, Dawkins would, argue, Dawkins would argue that the watch is more complex than the human brain blind watchmaker and things like that, because in order to understand the watch requires, in, in, at a much higher level, but in order to understand the structure of a watch, which is so elegantly denied, uh -huh. it's infinitely more complex than the brain, because in order to create that kind of symmetry requires this downward movement. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, 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 it's, it's, it's a matter of looking down through the whole, through the whole hierarchy, and I'm not, that's not the way I'm talking. I'm looking at it from the side. I would, okay. I would argue very strongly that the watch is nowhere, nowhere, you know, I'll never forget uh, Me too. John, Fr John Franklin was a writer for the Baltimore uh, Sun, and he got a Pulitzer Prize for a series on neurophysiology, neurosurgery and whatnot. And he, he, he talks about this one neurosurgeon. Uh, I, doctors are a funny thing. My sister's a doctor. She's a pathologist. Anyway, he comes, he's a brain surgeon. He comes in with his brain, and he throws it down on the table, splat, you know, and he says, see that? That's a machine. It's a very complicated machine, but it's a machine. And I'm going to learn how it operates. You know, I, I, I read that and I was horrified. Because, uh, be, be, because well, you know, it's, here it's again, it's, it's the, uh, uh, the, 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 the mechanical metaphor run amok and whatnot. And, and how the brain operates, I think, is a, it's 
very hierarchically structured. Uh, there's a lot of, of vagueness and ambiguity in it, which gives us free will. Uh, it's, not that, uh, it's not that as I'm here talking, there aren't certain patterns that are going on in my brain, which if you hooked me up would, would turn silver and yellow and red or gold or whatever those little pictures are and so forth. I'm not denying that at all. I'm simply saying that uh, uh, the, the, the linkages are not truly mechanical. There's a, there's a lot of redundancy. There's a lot of choice. Um, uh, it's not a machine. It's not a watch. And it's very much more complicated. But that's my opinion. Can I get you in? And all of a sudden, there's this, I think there was this revelation, at least from my generation, that, well, you know, we're part of a, a whole system. And, and uh, you know, the, the oxygen isn't, isn't just there in the atmosphere. It's like created and maintained and all this sort of that seeing ourselves within that ecosystem is a very, very different, very, very unexpected mm -hmm. from the point of view of a Darwinian model. And this whole idea that there are many, many organisms out there finding ways to make, you know, make a living, so to speak, and then that they're all integrated in this whole yeah. thing seems to be enormously striking. And yet the neo-Darwinians are still back here, you know, grinding out population biology and, and uh, this sort of thing. Anyway, there's something so fundamental about the economics of an ecosystem that's simply not there in the Darwinian thing at all. And mm -hmm. it's just so seems to me that you know, once you just look at it, it's so obvious. Well, as, as you were saying, and something you pointed out to me, actually, is that um, my whole description of Odom's uh, uh, animation and so forth, his protoact, is really a work cycle. Uh, and it's really, a, it's really, I hate to use the word engine, because that, that's a mechanical uh, metaphor well, and so forth. It's a process. Yeah, it's, it, it, it is a work process. And as a matter of fact, the, the actual, uh, I didn't talk about any of my mathematics that go along with this, believe it or not, there are some. Um, uh, the, the, the whole quantification of ascendancy is what it thermodynamically is known as a work function. Uh, so that, um, uh, and, and, and it's a work function because you can even, you can even split it down into its components which represent uh, an amount of flow that is lifted up through a certain number of trophic levels. So there's this, this qualitative nature of, of, of work also. It all comes together very nicely. Um, and, and yes, it's there in ecology, and it, uh, it, it, it's missing in, uh, uh, in uh, Darwinian theory. Uh, Schneider and, and, and Sagan, uh, Dorian Sagan, the, uh, the son of uh, Lynn Margulis and, and Carl Sagan, uh, put out a book into the cool, and I think one of the things that our, we, and we, you know, Eric and I go back a long way, but I think one of the things we agree on is that there's definitely directionality in the physical world, and yet, and yet, as biologists were not allowed to acknowledge any 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 directionality. This has always been a puzzle to me as to why you can point out things in the physical world, but you're prohibited and tabooed from talking about them in the biological world. It's really a strange thing. Kind of like the Inquisition. <laughs> yes. Yes. It really is. I mean, it, you know, yeah. Paul Feyerabend, who was one of my mentors and stuff, wrote a bunch of stuff saying essentially that the the uh, what is it called masters of science now were behaving essentially like the people, the guy, the priest did the worst of the worst in the Inquisition. Yes. And now they're doing this stuff and making pronouncements. His whole thing is making pronouncements in areas and in ways that they had no knowledge of. They weren't even knowledgeable. <laughs> I mean, we're scientists. We well, I'm I'm guilty of that too. I mean, I'm always taking oh, yeah, pronouncements yeah, yeah. in areas that are, you know, <laughs> well, chemical they're engineering. <laughs> they were, they're, just, they're going into areas that, and, and making uh, extrapolations that are way, way beyond yeah. their knowledge. And if they would actually go in the field and look at the stuff, they would see that. The, yeah. but anyways, I think that sociology of the situation <laughs> strikes me a lot. And so for others that were here, I heard Laughlin at the beginning, you know, the first speaker, mm -hmm. Robert Laughlin. Right about the whole sociology of the scientific community and, the, the, and how this positivist model tended to dominate and anybody who you know, varied out of that was you know, going to be ostracized. And At least you don't publish. But I think ecology is very, very, very important and the deep ecology is like that, but it's been yeah. essentially suppressed. Yeah. Well, I, I have an example. You know, I, I wrote an article in uh, uh, 1999, well, actually earlier than that. It's called Life After Newton. And it essentially was the precursor of what I talked about tonight, and I sent it off to the journal uh, Philosophy and Biology, and I won't mention the editor by name, but essentially sent it out to, for review, and nine months later in came the reviews, and they were critical, and some of the criti crit criticisms were, were justified, but they essentially they said publish it, and he turned, he turned it down. And, and then I called and said, what gives here? Why did you wait nine months? And he says, oh, you're just mad at me. And so he says, 
you can't actually believe we're going to publish something like this. Really? And you know, the, the, this person has a very high visibility in the religion uh, science dialogue these days, incidentally. Isn't it like just one of the there was a thing years ago, uh, Roger Lewin did a study on what was the most rejected paper uh -huh. in physics. Right. And it was essentially it was saying that, that it was saying that special relativity was wrong. <laughs> okay. Which now you see this conflict between quantum theory and special relativity, and you know which one are you going to give up? Yeah. Pretty much everyone's gone. We're not giving up quantum theory, so relativity has got to be. You know. uh -huh. and there are all sorts of things. I mean, the the uh, Laughlin was saying that uh, the, the, the storyline that the students are given, like the Michelson Morley experiment, we discovered that there was no ether and all this sort of stuff. Isn't this wonderful? So, no, no, no. We didn't discover there was no ether. We just discovered that the ether was relativistic. The ether's still there. It's called the vacuum now. But you don't go out there and say, oh, the ether's there, we didn't do the ether, because there's this, there's this uh, storyline, you know, this, this become like biblical stories, you know, that yeah. are taken as literal, and you mm -hmm. know, no one's allowed to say anything you know, different from them. And I think this whole, I mean, we need to, I think we need to get our sabers out and go after some of these kinds of things. <laughs> now that you're retired, do you want to enjoy anything? <laughs> <laughs> 15 more months. <laughs> I, I, may, I, may, I may return and word may have gotten back and suddenly I find myself out on the curb. <laughs> yeah. Question. Uh, you know, you talk about these systems and that you know, there's a, by their very nature, there's this indeterminate nature to them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which leaves you know one to to ponder you know you know as we go through life we want to bring in good things you know basically leave the world a little better but you know uh, I have trouble with some of my uh, ecologist friends you know you know you know at Chesapeake Bay you've seen all the nasty things that oh, yeah. you know have been created but on the other hand there's almost this tendency well if you can't prove that no bad is going to come from this you can't go forward, which kind of flies in the face of this indeterminism. So, how do we that, go that, that's forward? The, that, that's the that's the that's the was the, that's the conservative the, principle or something yeah, like that's that. The yeah. European approach, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's the caution, the, the the cautionary <clears throat> principle. Is that it? I think that's what it is, the cautionary principle. Okay, and your question is then, how can we reconcile the cautionary principle with the the urge to do good, oh, so to speak? Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it is a dilemma, surely. Uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, etc., etc. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and I must confess, as the, the ecologist in me puts a lot of store in the, in, in the cautionary principle, and, and yet, uh, and yet I, I'm not doctrinaire when it comes to something like uh, uh, genetic... Uh, uh, okay, like uh, genetic, genetically Im improved uh, grains and so forth and so forth. What I want, what I want out of the engineer in this case is a recognition that the ecosystem exists. In other words, we can't just wi willy-nilly go ahead and design new fruits for, 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 for various uh, uh, attributes that they will have and so forth, be they nutritive or growing or something like that, without taking into account what's going to be their fate in the environment, how much is it going to, to cost to, you know, you let them out there and usually one of two things happens, either they go they, go, they, they escape and go wild and cause you major problems there, or to keep them going, you've got to invest an enormous amount of, of, of energy and so forth. And, and we're not doing those sort of, of analyses. We're not thinking uh, ecologically uh, before we go and do them. So, so my, my personal feeling in all of that is, is uh, yeah, we all want to do good, and, uh, uh, and we all want to be engineers and do something better for humankind. Uh, but let us in doing that, always remain cognizant of the ecosystem and, and, and always be willing to put our ideas to the test of how is it going to function in the ecosystem? What's the, you know, the, the ultimate end of it? I'll just phrase that in a negative though, because this is what I was thinking about. Do, do your thoughts and ideas on the difficulty of trying to predict the uh, outcome in biological or ecological systems? So that you have A in the conference of those that would say, hell with it. We can all drive SUVs and burn as much gasoline as we choose because you can't prove that by warming, by putting carbon monoxide to the air, you're warming the environment. Now maybe this is just... Uh -huh, uh -huh. I, I, okay, I, I, I see where you're going with that. Yeah. Uh, if, if the world out there is not determinate, um, uh, 
Well, it's not determinate, and yet, as I mentioned, I, I laid emphasis on particular and unique events, okay? And we always have to be cognizant yes. that that can happen. On the other hand, I also took cognizance of the fact that there, uh, there is a lot of regularity uh, in the organic world, and there are lots of correlations, and that uh, I didn't say we can't use probability, I simply said that, that probability can't cover everything. And I think there, there are arguments that can be made within the domain of probability uh, that, that, that would say that something might be foolhardy and that if you're going to get out there and, and, and burn as much gas as fast, fast as possible and put as much nitrous oxide in the world as quickly and in the air as quickly as possible, that we're going to suffer some major consequences. And, uh, you know, I think the probability, you know, we, we can never say for sure. I mean, um, when we get up in a court of law, we pretend that we're saying for sure, sure, but, uh, but we really can't. We really know that, and if you pressed far enough, we'll say so. Uh, uh, but if, you're, if your probabilities are fairly overwhelming, we go with that. You know, one of the things you say, you talk about Popper, and I was just rereading uh, World of Propensity's book, and, and he talks about, I'm going I'm to paraphrase, because basically uh, he's suggesting that the way in which systems develop is that they have solutions before they have problems. Okay, and this is sort of like, uh, what did uh, Darwin call them? Uh, Pre-adaptations? Uh -huh. Okay. And basically it's saying, it's sort of, I like the, the people said this about the computers. They said, so what's a computer good for? And they said, well, a computer is a solution looking for problems. <laughs> and if a system is synergistic, as we're talking, okay, in other words, as things start developing, that the system creates potential, okay, and all of a sudden, like we're we talking about, we're in current mm -hmm. potential. Because the system has more potential, then it has this potential, but it's blind. It doesn't know how to use it. And of course, you can use it in crazy ways. And this is one of the reasons when you say, well, this is part of the solution, so to speak, of theodicity. You know, there's why are there bad things, or yeah, why yeah, do people yeah. screw up? It's because all of a sudden we're put in a position of, of enormous power in relationship to the things around us, and we don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, how do, what, how do we learn? Well, we got to screw up, yeah. we got to learn, we got to talk to each other, we got to communicate. But there's no answer to that. There's no mm -hmm. ultimate solution because as we grow and as, we op as the system develops, there's more and more potential. And that potential is not defined. It's like you win a million dollars, it doesn't tell you how to spend it. Well, uh, one thing I did not <coughs> emphasize in my talk that I emphasized in earlier talks, and perhaps I should have, is the is the uh, uh, the complementarity between efficiency and uh, uh, reliability. Okay, uh, we all tend to think that we can have our cake and eat it too. And the, the reality is that uh, as if you push for efficiency, you've got to uh, you got to slack off of reliability, and if you push for reliability, you've got to, you've got to pay a cost and efficiency and whatnot, and there's always a trade-off between the two. And the bottom line is that we need both. Um, you know, and I, I talk about this in dialectic fashion, and I say that there's this, this one tendency towards this organization, we call it the second law. There's an opposing tendency, uh, this, this autocatalytic process I've talked to you that tends to build order up, and they oppose one another at this level, they're diametrically opposite. Uh, you get more of one, you have less of the other, and so forth. But, but the idea is that in order for a system to persist over the long term, it needs both of them. So that to the next level, uh, you need both. If the system becomes too efficient, it becomes brittle, and it then becomes vulnerable to some out external perturbation. If the system is too reliable and, and flexible, it has no internal structures, falls apart internally. So that, so that those successful systems are those that are not the most efficient, really, but those that they carry with them the best modicum of, of, of efficiency and reliability for the overall circumstances. I put this all in mathematical terms, in terms of oh, you know, these complementarities of ascendancy and overhead is what I, I call them, and, and I, I put it to, to information theory uh, as applied to networks. And it, it, works, all, it works out very nicely, and it, it tells a very nice story. And to get to pop, to get back to your question then, uh, being uh, solutions waiting for a problem, uh, I would say to the geneticist, this is what all the junk DNA is all about, okay? Uh, the, the organism is willing to pay a price to carry all this junk DNA around, it's not being used and so forth, because as soon as the system changes, there's a great reservoir of diversity that can then call upon to incorporate into its, uh, its, its, its main workings. It can call them up, so to speak, to solve the problem, the solutions are there, and here come the problems. Well, where where does the junk DNA come from? I mean, why is it there? How did it get? There? Yeah, uh, I, you're asking a question of a chemical engineer, and I honestly don't know. But I'm I'm just going to say that that very likely. Um, 
Uh, very likely there are the remnants of old repertoires which are no longer needed, some of which have disappeared and passed from the scene, and some of which just, just are retained. And they're useless. They're incoherent. You know, this is the idea, this is, this is, this is the, the, the strange thing. I mean, we're talking about theodicy and so forth. Uh, 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 you know, why would a system want to keep around things that are inefficient, incoherent, uh, um, um, Oh, I don't know, all, all the bad things you can think of and overhead. so forth. Uh, over, uh, <laughs> over, yeah, overhead, because, uh, because this is all judged in, com in, in, in the context of what is, what is currently very important now. Uh, because system, things change, the environment changes, uh, the existences changes, and, uh, and, and they need that, what I call uh, uh, a reserve, uh, uh, what is it? adaptability and reserve, if you will, to, 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 to reconfigure to the new, to the new thing. And uh, these things, you know, how do they come? Uh, in, in ecosystems, uh, you know, they, were, they, they may be migrants that, that maintain a marginal existence or something like that. Um, uh, they may be uh, something that was very, very much a part of the, the material cycle at one point and it just sort of faded off to the, to the, uh, to the periphery and, and nature carries these on because they are, they are persistence, they're insurance for the future. You know, to, to me... But there's just, a cost to it. You just made a case for getting a liberal arts, D, D, a liberal arts degree in a science-run work... Uh, 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 excuse me, I, 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 I stutter. And given the place of this, I'll lock up totally. <laughs> <laughs> Unless I get a top hat and a cane out of the dance. <laughs> but, um, see, a lot of your talk struck me as a poem. And. No, I'm, I'm complimented. <laughs> yeah, because it's, it preserves the mystery, the unknown, as a vital part of life. Yes, yeah. an absolute necess necessary part of yeah. it. Yeah, and because without, with, without it, it would be too brut brut brutal a, a, uh, a, 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 a world and so much would, uh, would, would, would fall apart. A Spartan efficient society, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. No, you, you, there, are, there are political ramifications. You know, I talk about this, this dialectic and so forth, and, and the, uh, uh, the ascendancy, the increase of ascendancy, uh, tends to be associated with the right, whereas the, the, uh, the, the retention of overhead and equality and egalitarianism tends to be to the political left. And the idea is that we need political dialogue, between responsible political dialogue between these two, in order to maintain a healthy society. If we go too far to one side or the other, we no longer have a healthy political society. Yeah. One last no. question, maybe or maybe not. My daughter has a degree in English. Bruce, Bruce, <laughs> Bruce, 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 all right. The engineer. Yeah. Bruce. Hey, Bob, I really enjoyed your, your talk. You did a fantastic job. Um, uh, I guess I'll, I'll bring out my physicist hat. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been mean on physicists here, so this is my time to take it back. <laughs> Rather than the engineering hat. But I mean, in a sense, it's both. And that is do you, do you see this, the process of emergence? Uh, in, a, in authorization or in violation to the conservation of energy and momentum? No, I, uh, I think that um, Elsasser uh, addresses this particular problem, that uh, I'm not saying that, that the, the conservation of mass or the conservation of energy is violated in any of this. Uh, uh, what I'm saying, and probably Stu Kaufman, I think, said it better than I, is that with successive, compl successive complexity, your options grow much faster than can be controlled by one or two constraints. You know, the con conservation of momentum, conservation of mass, and so you're talking about just a few constraints, and that things sort of spill over the sides, if you will. And there's lots of wiggle room, uh, to use the Philip Hefner's term, uh, for creativity. Uh, 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 Carl Sagan, in his uh, introduction to 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 uh, Stephen Hawkins' A Brief History of Time says there's nothing left for a creator to do. Philip Hefner said, I don't believe in miracles because my science friends have convinced me that there's no wiggle room for God to act on. And what I'm trying to say is there's wiggle room in yes. abundance out yes. there. 
It really Can you is. Say, maybe one response to that, because that was obviously <laughs> weird. <laughs> with, with, without, without violating those, those constraints. I'm really, for the first time, <laughs> beginning to ask that question seriously. Because there was a guy, there were a couple of guys uh, that were uh, Maxwell's uh, contemporaries, Balfour Stewart and, and uh, Peter Tate. Tate's famous for his knot theory. And, so forth. and they wrote a book about that time. I spent 100 bucks, I, which I haven't read the book, but it's an old book, hasn't been repeated. Well, they're essentially trying to argue, and it's not clear whether they're saying that the energy is increasing, but certainly the nature of the energy is changing in a manner that is not accountable within a mechanical thing. And it's sort of like you struggle with the thing, and Stu Kaufman is struggling with it too. Are the possibilities of the universe expanding? If there are possibilities, then those possibilities are like gradients. Mm -hmm. The forces of the universe are changing. And is it balanced by something going down? You know, like we're all nice, you know, uh, Darwinians, we're all Euclidean geometry and stuff, and, and so we've all been so schooled in that yeah. that we're inclined to say yes, but of course, what is the energy all of a sudden becomes very ambiguous, and so the question then gets reframed. So I think it's a great question. I think it's, 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 uh, it's on the table. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Last, last. <coughs> One final question. Sure. I have a question. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> let me bookmark that because I did want to make a comment. Okay. Okay. I'm sure. sorry. I'll just say very quickly, you know, and I say this in my book, my second book, so it's nothing really new, is that I have some doubts about the conservation of energy. And people say, oh my God, you know? And, and uh, uh, not, that, not that, that it's a very, nature, very different nature than what we, we suppose in our calculations of thermodynamics, that it's always quantitatively conserved. And, and where did we come from this? Well, we had work up here, and Joel had this experiment with powder wheels, and it became heat over here. And of course, it's all degraded down here. But what he what, what he said, because conservation was such an overwhelming and, and useful way to look at things, he says this is the same energy here as it was here, and we'll make them equivalent. We got joules, joules constant. Okay. Uh, in other words, it's good bookkeeping to say that it is quantitatively constant. Now. I think it is true, it's a phenomenological fact of the first law that energy cannot be totally destroyed. There's always a non-zero residual, okay? But, but to say that, it's, to say that it, it can do as much work, no. Uh, and we finesse this by saying there are two laws of thermodynamics. It's conserved and it degrades. And I, I, only, I only see things as, as simply degrading. Uh, the whole business of conservation is, is simply an artifact. Uh, 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 an epistemological artifact. It's not, it, it, it's not an ontological uh, reality. This, this is a personal question that is private, if I say so. Yes, sir. Um, could you tell us how you and your wife decided to name Anastasia for your daughter? Oh, 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 what a, what a question. <laughs> Repeat the question. How, why did we call her Anastasia? I will tell you gladly, and we tell this to all of our friends, okay? On December 17th, 1964, my wife and I were invited to a party. Um, uh, and I'm going to probably step on some people's toes here, so I'll have to, I have to watch myself, okay? Um, we were invited to a party, uh, and we didn't know one another and so forth. And at the time, I was learning Russian, okay? And I, and I, 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 I you know, I, a nice looking lady came up to her, and someone had told me that she was Ukrainian. And, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is all past history, okay? This is not contemporary <laughs> stuff. So I, I came up to her and I said, oh, well, I hear you're Ukrainian. Yes, I said, do you speak Russian? She clenched her teeth and looked at me, <laughs> and she says, I should throw this drink in your face. <laughs> And I, and I ran off to, you know, to another part of the room. <laughs> well, I, I have a little bit of a loud voice, and I'm talking to, to another lady who also happened to be uh, Ukrainian. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and I said, you know, well, if I ever had a daughter, I'd name her Anastasia. And I hear from the other side, Anastasia. She pops up, and she comes on over, and she starts telling me how Anastasia is part of a family name and whatnot. We get to talking, and uh, two weeks later, we're going out, and we're dating, and so forth. Well, well, you know, three years later we're married. We worked, we worked slow. In 11 years, 11 years to the day, on December 17th, 1975, we had our first child, a daughter, and we named her Anastasia. So, to, to, to any Russians in the crowd, you know, okay, we, we, no offense. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.